Welcome to The Woman's Connection. I'm Barry Louise Switzen, your moderator. The Woman's Connection is a program about events shaping women's lives and helping one gain authentic power on a personal or a professional level. So won't you stay tuned? Welcome. Starting a business is daunting, but what are the legal With me is Nina Kaufman, and we're going to discuss some of the finer points of legalizing your business and what to do and what not to do. Welcome, Nina. Thank you, Barry. It's good to be here. Um, thank you. I'm glad you could make it today. Let's start with you've been solo for a while, and now you're contemplating taking on a business partner. What should you be aware of? Well, Barry, the first thing to think about when you're taking on a business partner is why are you looking for grow? Because bringing on a business partner isn't just like buying another piece of equipment. It's like having another spouse. <laughs> if you choose the right one, it's terrific. If you don't choose the right one, it can be disastrous, particularly if you don't plan it out carefully. So I would say the first thing to ask yourself is why do you want to expand your business with a business partner and are there other ways to reach those goals? Well, what are some of the things that you look for when you're thinking about? Do you take on a person that you've been best friends with forever <gasps> or do you look at a Put a stake through my heart when you talk about best friends. If there were three things I think that you really want to look for. You've decided, yes, bringing on another business partner is the way to make your business grow. I would say the first thing you're looking for is someone who has complementary skills. You don't want to choose someone who does exactly what you do because then the two of you are stepping on each other's toes and the business doesn't grow through the extra resources that the new person brings on. The second attribute, I'd say, is uh, more personality characteristic, is one of accountability. Does this person to the table and what his or her needs are? These are some very thorny but important conversations that you really need to have to make sure that you are with someone who's prepared to make that commitment. And I'd say the third, again, if I'm only allowed three, if the third characteristic, uh, if I had to choose a third characteristic, it would be someone who's really willing to go the extra mile. Because building a business is not just like punching a clock for a nine to five job. It's in some ways like creating a child of your own. It takes on its own life, it has its own needs. Sometimes those needs are not so convenient based on your schedule. So you wanna make sure that you're not the 24-7 the type of person and your business partner is a nine to five. Uh, and also that given your personal lifestyles, you both have the same kind of commitment to making the business grow. Well, why are those attributes so important? Those three attributes are important because you're going into this ideally with a sense that you're in it for the long haul. Most entrepreneurs, when they're starting their business, are buying it to develop. They're not necessarily buying it to flip in two years to become the next it girl on the IPO market and then sell it and retire to Tahiti. Uh, many entrepreneurs, particularly if they started solo, are looking to grow to do more to develop their brand. And that's become part of them. So these attributes are important because, again, you're looking for someone who has accountability, which is crucial in any aspect of business, but particularly for another owner. You're looking for someone who has complementary skills so that you, you really are expanding the resources available to them. Whether it's contact lists or a skill base, money, any of those things. You want to make sure you have more, not just more of the same. And the third, in terms of commitment, you both need to know what you're in it for. Because if you don't begin with the end in mind, you, 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 I found in advising entrepreneurs, they often end up slogging through year after year without a clear sense of, is this working for me? And in order to answer that question, is this working for me, you have to know what you need. 
You have to know what your personal goals are in three years, five years, ten years' time. And I find often business partners don't have those discussions before they go into business together. Where do women business entrepreneurs get in trouble when selecting a partner? Barry, that's a really good question. And I will say that particularly for women entrepreneurs, the biggest area where they get into trouble is they focus more on the relationship with the business partner and not the money aspects of the business. The reason that that's a problem is so bring on another business partner, it can often be reasons for companionship. And the same way that in our personal relationships, just getting involved with someone because you're lonely doesn't always lead to the best personal relationship, those are also reasons that it doesn't make for the best business partnership. So women business owners may often talk about how well are we getting along, do we understand that the other may need to take some Fridays off to deal with family issues. But what they often don't talk about is what do we need to take home to make sure that this business venture makes sense as business? Because this isn't meant to be a hobby and this isn't la-di-da. This is part of what's meant to support you and the lifestyle that you want to lead. So I find not having those discussions about money because they're afraid that somehow, oh, we're feeling good about each other, but if we talk about it, it'll be like a wet blanket on all our discussions. Uh, that can often lead to serious problems down the road. Money, it brings back a lot of negative feelings about money growing up. Don't talk about money, don't ask for raise, and it seems like there's a big parallel here. Money is, is a very uncomfortable subject in our society, particularly when it's on a very, very personal level. But once again, Barry, we're talking about business here. We're not just talking about two friends sitting over coffee where the relationship doesn't have to discuss money. When you're business partners, you do. You have a business that either is earning or not earning. How will you finance it? How else will the business grow? Is the business generating enough to support the owners of the business and any of the employees it may have? All of these are crucial questions to ensuring that you have a viable business and not just a money pit that you're going to have to sink your personal capital into on a regular basis. So as uncomfortable as it is, it's something that women who want to become business owners will have to overcome, and they can sometimes with the help of either a facilitator to your business plan and keeping your partnership on track? Yes, Barry, in some ways it does. I find that many entrepreneurs get started without a shred of a business plan. And while successful businesses have been started that way, Successful businesses don't always remain successful if at some point they don't give some serious thought to how they will grow and whether or not the business can support the business owners. So among the ways to keep it on track are to develop some kind of which is the financials, as dreadfully dull as they may be. That is, in fact, the most important part of your plan. So you way to make sure that partners stay on track is to ensure that they have a written, what I will call a partnership agreement. It may be, uh, from le a legal term, uh, a shareholders agreement for a corporation or an operating agreement for a limited liability company, but I'll just call it partnership agreement because we talk about business partners. A partnership agreement is important because it literally ensures that you and your partner are on the same page, to turn a phrase. When you see things in black and white about what it is avoid a lot of things that can come up, or, oh, I didn't hear that, or I misunderstood, or maybe you weren't listening when I was talking, or maybe I didn't want to hear what you were saying at the time. By having those things in writing, both of you can refer back to it on a regular basis. 
sounds almost as if you need a partner who's like the opposite of you. If you like administration and they like sales, that's a marriage made in heaven. But if you both like sales, that can be a disaster. Well, Mary, in some ways you're right. Uh, it, very, it does help for both partners to have complementary skills. If one has the detail orientation for administration and the other doesn't, terrific. What happens sometimes over time is that unless you're very careful about ensuring that both roles are valued in the company, you can start to run into problems. I've seen a lot of situations where it's the salesperson who's bringing in the business, who has the bigger, outsized personality that tends to overtake the quieter, more detail-oriented person who's handling the back office work. But you raise a very good point. If the two of you are doing exactly the same thing, and this sometimes happens, for example, even with lawyers or other professionals coming together to start a business, what the partners then need to do is to make sure that where there are gaps between what they offer and what the business needs can get filled by other people. So where the complementary skills are helpful is if you're going first from solo to then bringing on a business partner, how many more of the needs of the business can be filled by that one person? Are partnership agreements necessary and how do you know when it's not really working? Baron, that's a really good question. I have sort of a biased view of it. I do think that partnership agreements are necessary because partnership agreements are an opportunity for the partners to really have those discussions that they need to have about what I would consider the three crucial areas of the business. That is, the management of the business, you know, call it three M's, like Mary. Management of the business, money issues of the business, and what I'll call moving on. A real sticking point for a lot of business partners comes when one or the other put my hands around your throat. It could be because I've contracted breast cancer and I simply can't devote the kind of time to the business that I thought I could. Without a partnership agreement, the situation can get very, very messy about how do you divide up the assets of the business in a way that's fair to the business owners at that time. And especially when you're thinking about a situation where one or the other needs or wants to leave, you're dealing with a situation that has a lot of emotion in it. Uh, one or the other is feeling sad. That's not a time when people are really thinking logically about what's a fair division of assets particularly if it comes to any intellectual property or products that have been created by both partners. So a partnership agreement is a way of setting the ground rules very early on. Um, my husband is a huge baseball fan always says that one of the reasons you have the rules in baseball is that everyone can adhere to them when they get onto the baseball field. You know what to expect. And the same thing with running a business. When you have a partnership agreement, going to be when the two of you are getting along. So that should you not be getting along, you have a fair procedure you've already decided is fair that will be in place for you to use. When you are doing a partnership, what is best, a partnership, a limited liability, or a corporation? Oh, thank you, Barry. That's a good question. As a, an attorney, my real preference for anyone in business is to not do business in a general partnership form. That ideally, and there are reasons that you might want to choose over one over the other. Some of those reasons uh, are financial. In New York, it costs a lot more to start a limited liability company than it does a corporation. Uh, but there may be there are certain uh, tax issues that you need to weigh and balance. So it's important to talk to your, your tax advisor to figure out what's best for you, uh, as well as what your long-term goals are with the company. Um, for some, if you're thinking of going public, a corporation will be a better form than a limited liability company. But uh, an important reason that I mention corporation or limited liability company is the importance of protecting your personal assets. As you know, litigation has been on the rise for, especially commercial litigation, for, for years. 
um, there are just billions of dollars being spent on litigation and lawsuits in this country every year. And if you're doing business in the form of a general partnership, that means that the personal assets, your car, your home, grandma's heirloom, pin, your investment accounts, all of those things are available for creditors if they get a judgment against you. And you never know how lawsuits are going to turn out. So if there's no burning reason to do business as a sole proprietorship uh, or as a general partnership, I don't see why you would want to. Another important reason for considering a corporate form, Barry, is that I think, and from uh, the entrepreneurs I've met, they, they have a different mindset about their business. It's no longer themselves eking out an existence, putting on different hats. When they are the a limited liability company, they have a different sense of stewardship. They have a broader vision for the company. They have a longer term view. And to my mind, that ensures the greater success of the company going forward than the, the smaller mindset. Nina, what about somebody who's not a home-based business? What kind of pitfalls, legally, should they be aware of? Home-based businesses have many of the You will have issues with your clients. If, for example, you're a copywriter, and somebody isn't happy with your work, or it turns out you've plagiarized somebody else's, you're going to have some intellectual property and contract issues. As a home-based business, you may also have zoning issues, depending on whether or not, for example, you have a lot of foot traffic coming in and out of your, your home. Uh, medical practitioners, for example, uh, you know, yoga studios, you need to make sure that if you're operating community to allow for that. You'll also want to consider insurance. If you have vendors coming in and out of your home to, let's say, fix the computer, you need to make sure that you have the right insurance in place to cover their activities, to cover any trips and falls that may happen in your premises. And your homeowner's insurance doesn't always cover activities that you're doing for your business, albeit within your home. So you also want to make sure that you have insurance to cover your files and your business equipment. Again, one of the reasons so many home-based businesses fail is because they have difficulties raising capital. What should somebody be aware of when they're trying to raise capital, whether it's from families and friends or venture capitalists? Raising capital is a, a really thorny issue for a lot of business owners. There are several reasons why they have difficulty. The first is that they haven't put together a business plan. But they haven't given the forethought to explaining in detail how exactly that money is going to be used and why it will be a good investment. So for a lot of business owners without that, that business plan, is the step before venture capital, and particularly without a plan, they're not in this climate, they're not going to get venture capital, which would then want to catapult your company to doing business on, uh, to be, sorry, being traded on the stock market. So not having a well thought out business plan is, is certainly an obstacle. In addition, when people are raising money, trying to raise money from family and friends, an obstacle that they can run into is that they're treating it too casually. They're not treating it as business. All of a sudden, business isn't going so well, you haven't paid them back, and you're all sitting at Thanksgiving dinner, and they, they want to carve you up, not the turkey where business owners have to be very careful is to treat those loans 
as loans if that's how people are going to be giving them the money and not as an equity investment. If your father's loaning you $10,000, that needs to be documented. Because otherwise, it might be considered from a tax perspective a gift, and there could be penalties for a loan for not paying interest. All of those things come into play. Also, by having something noted as a loan, you can manage the expectations of your family members. You can have something in your loan that says, I will start paying you back six months from today, a year from today, at $500 a month. That way, when you have that Thanksgiving dinner in between today and next year, they're not sitting around with their hands on their hips saying, hello, where's my coming until next year. Well, that's one good way to salvage a family <laughs> enterprise <laughs> on a mini scale, whatever you want to call it. Let's say you, let's say you have raised capital, whether it's from your angel investors or your venture capitalists, and you formed a partner. What are some of the criteria you look for when you're hiring an individual, and things to keep in mind? Yeah, bringing on employees is a terrific way to grow your business, but that's where you that you need done. And what are the skills that that job requires? Then you'll want to think about, does the person who's coming in have the skills that you absolutely need to get that job done? Very often people are they're, they're eager to throw a warm body into a situation without really seeing whether the person can do the job or can very easily grow into the job. They don't necessarily check references. They don't have a way of pre-screening employees. So those are ways that uh, entrepreneurs get into trouble because you then And once you hire them, you have to be very, very careful about the circumstances under which you fire them. Because if you fire someone, and if, especially in this climate, with again, with the litigation, you fire someone for a reason that could be seen to be discriminatory, you could find yourself on the wrong end of a discrimination lawsuit. Well, that makes some fun and games. There are so many things that happen when you're developing a business, but one of the things that people start with is a website. And what are some of the fine points that you should be be a very thorny area, particularly from a legal perspective. For those people who are selling products online, very often the way you will have a contract with your customer is to have website terms and conditions. People will want to know, what's your return policy? How are you using my email? Is the place where I'm giving you my credit card information secure? What happens if the, the company is sold, are you going to be sharing my, my email address, my personal information? How are you maintaining all of that? Uh, so a lot of entrepreneurs as they're getting and what I call their, the terms and conditions. Also, if you're selling something over uh, outside of your state, you may be based in New York, but doing business with people in California, if there's any dispute, you don't want to have to run to California to resolve it. So those are some of the things that you would also put in your terms and conditions. Other things that you want to be mindful of as you're developing your website is if you're hiring a company to do it for you, you want to make sure that once they're done and you've paid them in full, that's called a work for hire. That way, if you choose to change hosts, if you want to make changes to the website, you're entitled to, you can use whoever you want, whomever you want to make those changes, and you're not necessarily beholden to that original web development company. As a practical matter, you also want to ask whether or not the coding can be transferred easily, can be changed easily, because websites require regular updates in order to be fresh, in order for people to want to see them. And you also want to work with a firm that has a sense of going to be looking for you and what terms are they going to use to try to find you on the internet. 
What about your logo? I mean, should you have a, a certified, not certified, but trademarked or registered? Uh, yes, you can certainly think about trademarking your logo. Very often, though, for entrepreneurs who are just getting started, their branding morphs and changes over time. So it's not always the best thing to jump out of the gate and spend a lot of money on. Best thing to do is to consult with an intellectual property attorney, get the low down, get a sense of the costs and fees and the time frame for rolling it out. In the closing moments of the show, what would you like to leave the audience with? I would say that what I'd love to leave the audience with is the importance of having a trusted advisory team. Every great athlete has a coach. Every great team has a series of coaches and managers. And if you want your business to grow, it's so important to be able to reach out to minds beyond your own. Again, whether you're expanding with a business partner, whether you're going to look to employees to provide that. But most especially, you want an objective third business. So you really, from the outset, you want to make sure that you have a good business attorney, an accountant, an insurance professional, a good relationship with a banker, and you also may want to consider taking on some kind of coach or a mentor relationship to ensure that you're uh, engaging in your own personal development as the business is engaging in its personal development. Nina, thank you so much for joining me today. If you have any questions, Nina Kaufman, Esquire, would be very happy to answer them. Look forward to hearing from you. Bye now.